the time is now two o'clock in the interest of time and, uh, and all the matters we'd like to discuss today. I think we're going to start um, and try to be as punctual as possible. So first of all, welcome to all our uh, panelists and attendees. Um, I can see the number is slowly increasing. So hopefully as we progress, we'll get more and more uh, participants and uh, listeners. My name is uh, Oren Scheffler. Um, and I'm a research fellow at HMS, the Haifa uh, Maritime Policy and Strategy uh, Research Center at the University of Haifa. And it's my pleasure and honor to, to moderate this uh, panel of experts on um, a key issue related to the law of the sea. Um, the issue that we are going to focus on today is um, the protection of innocent and transit passage in maritime choke points. Uh, it is difficult to ensure uh, innocent and transit passage through navigational straits. Uh, there are many states, whether they are party to UNCLOS or not, in Israel case, not, not quite so, um, but most states reserve their traditional interpretations of the right of innocent passage and transit passage. These are terms that we'll dive into today. Um, and coastal states, the states that are aligned to, to the sea, you could say, they can establish and enforce laws uh, for their territorial waters and their straits, but they cannot prevent in any way um, passage through these uh, maritime choke points. Um, these uh, laws, the law of the sea raises many legal concerns and, and gray areas which require interpretation. And these are the types of things that we're going to discuss today. Um, so to keep this moving forward, first of all, I would like to call um, or ask Professor um, Shaul Choleb, the head of the HMS Center here at Haifa, to open uh, this webinar, webinar with his uh, opening remarks. Professor Choleb. Thank you very much, Orin. I just good add, we are recording this session. Um, if anyone would like to um, discuss this afterwards, please feel free to, Professor Choleb. Thank you very much, Oren, and uh, good afternoon from Israel. And thank you all for joining us for today for a conference entitled UNCLOS and the Protection of Innocent and Transit Passage in the Maritime Choke Points, which we expect to be interesting as well as thought provoking. Maritime choke points are among the most sensitive locations where geography, trade, and politics meet. The challenges posed by the Middle East choke points arose in the 20th centuries has become more urgent in recent years. Israel itself had bad experience in terms of the transit passage. The 1956 Sinai War and the 1967 Six Days War broke out following the blockade of the Straits of Tehran in the entrance to the Gulf of Elat. These days, Israel, whose one third of its maritime trade to the Far East is transported through the Red Sea, is concerned about the deteriorating security conditions in the Southern Red Sea region, and especially in the Strait of Bab el -Mandeb. At the outset, I would like to thank Dr. Alexander Brekel, director of CAS. Israel for his support and decision to maintain HMS participation in CAS activities for the year 2021. I would like also to thank Advocate Orin Scheffler, Senior Fellow Maritime Policy and Strategy Research Center, who enthusiastically took the assignment of organizing this important conference, coordinated all the preparations, and composed skillfully the final agenda and sessions. For those just uh, getting to know the center, HMS is part of the University of Haifa and has in its focus the Eastern Mediterranean and the Red Sea. Our mission is to promote and conduct interdisciplinary research in the areas of maritime strategy, regional security, and foreign policy, movements of goods, people and idea, maritime law, as well as cyber maritime issues, energy 
and the maritime environment. The center was founded in 2016, is a nonpartisan interdisciplinary research center dedicated to emphasizing the growing strategic importance of Israel's maritime domain to key decision makers and the Israeli public. HMS has also expanded its core expertise by combining with two other universities of Haifa Research Center. The Ezri Center, which focuses on the geostrategic issues involving Iran and the Gulf State, and the Vidra Institute, which examined shipping and ports. The establishment of the HMS reinforced the University of Haifa's efforts to lead the national maritime research within framework of Mediterranean Sea Regional Center of Israel. Some of the center's recent research include the escalating crisis in the Eastern Mediterranean resulting from recent Turkish naval initiatives, the impact of Chinese investment at the port of Haifa, the impact of global warming on the Mediterranean, and energy issues of the Eastern Mediterranean. All topics vital to Israel and the region as a whole. This research and analysis are often conducted with academic partnership formed with leading European, Eastern Mediterranean, Asian and American research centers and institutions. Incidentally, this morning we had been honored to sign an additional collaboration agreement with the Frederick University of Limassol, Cyprus. Thank you all for choosing to attend this important international conference, which deal with such an important and relevant issue. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Professor Cholev, and also, of course, for the kind words. Um, it brings me great pleasure to ask uh, Dr. Alexander Brackel of the Cass Institute to uh, say his opening remarks. Thank you very much and welcome to every one of uh, you who's joining us today at your, your computers. Um, as uh, was correctly said, my name is Alexander Brackel and I'm the head of the Israel Office of the Conrad Adenauer Foundation. The Conrad Adenauer Foundation, as uh, many of you might know, is a German political institute closely associated with the Christian Democratic Union. Uh, Angela Merkel's party, and we work both domestically and abroad. And the Israel office is one of our most important officers. Um, and uh, what we are trying to do is to strengthen the bilateral relationship between the countries we work in and Germany uh, in relevant policy fields. So we can only do that by closely collaborating with our local our partners, which is why I'm taking a lot of pride in our partnership uh, with HMS and the Hyper uh, University because they definitely provide the insight in um, the details of uh, such a complicated matter as the one we're discussing today that we could never bring uh, to the table. But I think however complicated and technical the matter of today's conference might be, um, we all understand, or at least will understand by the end of uh, the day, how vital uh, these questions are. And hopefully today's conference will not only give us a glimpse into um, the matter and the complexity of the matter, but it will also shed some light on uh, potential uh, solutions to all of the difficult questions we're going to discuss. Thank you very much. And really looking forward to today's conference. Thank you, Dr. Brackel. Um, as we move forward, I'd just like to uh, point out that all the registrants have received uh, a booklet with the biographies of the experts. Uh, in the interest of time, we're fast forwarding, but I can assure you, as you'll see in the booklet, that everyone um, is the leader of their, uh, of their uh, knowledge base uh, on a worldly basis. Um, so please do refer to that booklet. I'd like to pass the panel over to the first panel, Dr. Eli Retig, um, who is the moderator for this uh, panel titled Innocent Passage and Transit Passage. Thank you, Oren, and uh, hi, everyone. Uh, welcome to the first of two very interesting uh, panels that we have today. 
Uh, good morning to our US viewers, good afternoon to our Middle East viewers, good evening to our Australian uh, participants and viewers. Uh, I'm Eli Reddig, I will be moderating this panel. Uh, I'm a senior fellow at the Maritime Policy and Strategy Research Center at the University of Haifa and at the Heike and Geo, uh, uh, Chair of uh, Geostrategy. Um, this first panel is meant to kind of set the stage for what we will be discussing today, which is the transit, uh, innocent and transit passage uh, in maritime choke points. What is the problem? Is it a problem? How do we define it? Who are the main actors to consider? Uh, and what type of complications are we going to see more of as time goes by? The next panel will then offer some pragmatic legal solutions uh, to these problems that we will define in this panel. So for that, we've assembled uh, an all-star team of legal and scientific uh, experts uh, from Australia, from Israel, from the United Arab Emirates, uh, which will, I, I will introduce in a moment. Uh, I asked the panelists to each give uh, about 10 minute presentation, up to 10 minutes, uh, and that will leave us for about 20 minutes for discussions and Q&A. Uh, members of the audience, you are encouraged to ask questions in the chat room and in the Q&A. I will collect them and all of these comments in the chat, and then at the end of the three presentations, uh, we will open it up for, uh, for a discussion. Okay, so um, allow me to uh, introduce our first speaker, uh, Professor Donald R. Rothwell, uh, Rothwell, Fellow of the Australian Academy of Law. For the past 15 years, Donald Rothwell has been serving as a professor of international law at the College of Law at, at the Australian National University in Canberra. His research focuses on the law of the sea, the law of the polar regions, and the implementation of the international law in uh, Australian context. He has authored, co-authored, and edited 26 books and over 200 articles and chapters uh, on these subjects, both in Australian and in international venues. His most recent book is titled The Law of the Sea in Southeast Asia, uh, Environmental, Navigational, and Security Challenges, which was published by Rutledge, uh, which he co-edited with David Letts. Professor Rothwell is also the general editor of the Australian Yearbook of International Law and editor-in-chief uh, of the Brill Research Perspectives in Law of the Sea. Between 2012 and 2018, he was the rapporteur of the International Law Association Committee on Baselines under the International Law of the Sea. Now I can go, go on and on because the list of, uh, of accolades uh, is very long, but I think by now it's pretty clear that uh, to the audience that we couldn't have found a better scholar uh, to talk to us about this uh, subject. And thank you so much for uh, coming and agreeing to speak with us. So I will stop here and give the floor to Professor Rothwell. Thanks very much for that uh, very kind invitation. And uh, good evening from Australia. Uh, good afternoon, good morning to those of you in other parts of the world. Uh, I'm really delighted to be uh, joining you today and actually speaking about one of my, my favorite topics, um, I've had a long interest in, in questions of navigation under the law of the sea. So I'm very pleased to be able to share that with you uh, today. Um, just by way of background, uh, the, the whole question of, of navigational rights and freedoms, certainly in the territorial sea is very much wrapped up with the whole issue of uh, the question of the freedom of the seas, which has been one of the central conundrums of the law of the sea as it's been developed uh, over a, a number of centuries. And it, it's, it's a key dimension of how we view the, the oceans regime and whether we look at the oceans regime through the, the lens of UNCLOS or whether we look at it through customary international law, uh, the freedom of navigation, the freedom of the seas is, is a critical dimension. Now, of course, as part of that dimension, We've seen certainly uh, post-1945 uh, a gradual recognition of the legitimacy of literal states to be able to assert claims to a range of maritime zones. Of course, the, the Territorial Sea was a, a maritime zone that was recognised uh, into the 19th century, but uh, state practice and international law through various treaties has just reconfirmed that uh, as we've passed uh, through the last hundred odd years. And to that end, the 1958 Geneva Convention is a critical starting point, and I particularly want to draw everyone's attention uh, to the significance of the decision uh, of the International Court of Justice in the Corfu Channel case, which I'll talk about in a number of contexts today. Um, the Corfu Channel uh, is, of course, uh, a, a relatively narrow uh, body of water that separates 
uh, Corfu uh, from uh, the Albanian mainland. Uh, but in 1946, there was a very significant incident uh, that occurred there with respect to uh, British warships. And that raised uh, a series of issues in terms of what were uh, the legitimate navigational rights that applied uh, during peacetime, remembering that this incident occurred post-World War II. And that quote that you can see on the slide is an important one, that the view of the International Court of Justice, and mindful that they're talking here about customary international law, was that in times of peace, there is a right to send warships through straits used for international navigation, providing the passage is innocent. So that immediately raised a number of important questions about what is an international strait and what exactly is innocent passage. So I'll come back to pick up on that uh, a little later, but we move then on to um, the, the codification to a degree of some of those elements in the 1958 convention uh, on the territorial sea and contiguous zone where article 14 recognizes the right of innocent passage, article 15 saying the coastal states are not to hamper innocent passage, and then the only real reference to the Corfu Channel outcome uh, you can find in Article 16, uh, where it says that there's to be no suspension of innocent passage through a strait used for international navigation. So that's really the, the, the previous law. Let's move on then to uh, the current law, the current legal framework that sits within the uh, 1982 UN Convention on the Law of the Sea, which I should say for the purposes of my presentation, I predominantly would argue reflects customary international law on some of the key points that we're talking about. And so within the, the territorial sea, uh, which can of course extend up to 12 nautical miles, uh, the convention makes it very clear that there is a right of innocent passage. Uh, that's a right of innocent passage that applies to the ships of all states. And of course, operationally, uh, this right of innocent passage is really one that we think about in terms of foreign shipping within the waters of the, of the coastal state. So that raises a number of issues. What exactly is passage for the purposes of the Law of the Sea Convention? Well, it's, it's actually a physical movement of a vessel, um, but it doesn't immediately contemplate that that vessel would enter the internal waters of a state. So uh, a vessel could not move from the territorial sea to internal waters back out into the territorial sea unless that vessel is actually proceeding to or from internal waters. So if a vessel is, is physically moving to a port or harbour within internal waters, well then the right of innocent passage is enjoyed in that particular uh, setting. And so passage as it's contemplated under Article 18 of the Convention is to be continuous and expeditious. Stopping and anchoring of a vessel engaged in this right of passage is only uh, appropriate if it's incidental to passage or as a result of force majeure or distress. So when we think about innocent passage, uh, there are these two real key dimensions. One is that there's a physical movement of a vessel. And secondly, the conduct of the vessel. What type of conduct is the vessel engaging in consistent with the notion of innocent passage? And that's where most importantly, the 82 convention gives us quite a detailed definition of what innocent passage comprises in article 19. It generally says that passage is innocent, providing it's not prejudicial to the peace, good order or security of the coastal state, that it takes place in conformity with other relevant international rules. And then perhaps most significantly, in Article 19, Paragraph 2, we have a, a series of 12 different types of activities, which would be considered effectively not to be consistent with the right of innocent passage. And you can see some of those examples listed there. Some of them are relatively self-evident, any threat or use of force, any exercise or practice of weapons uh, would not be consistent with the right of innocent passage. Interestingly, fishing activities are also not considered to be consistent with the right of innocent passage. So Article 19 of the Convention brings a great deal of clarity to the right of innocent passage that we didn't really find under the previous regime uh, in the 1958 Geneva Convention. Nevertheless, there is a number of issues that arises here. Who makes a determination as to whether or not passage is innocent or not? What is the evidentiary standard? Is it an objective standard or is it a subjective standard? Is it a standard that, that in reality favours the coastal or the literal state? And the, what are the consequences if determination is made that passage is not innocent? Can the passage be suspended? Can the passage be barred? Or can there be a use of force to actually prevent uh, the right of passage uh, continuing? 
I guess one of the ways to think about Innocent Passage is that it talks about rights and duties of coastal states. And some of the duties are outlined in Article 24. The coastal state is under an obligation not to hamper Innocent Passage. It's not to deny Innocent Passage. It's not to discriminate between various types of vessels. And it's to give appropriate publicity to dangers to navigation. So the rights extend to uh, preventing passage, which is not innocent, and I've touched on that. The right also extends to temporarily suspending innocent passage under certain circumstances. Uh, a good example of that is weapons exercise. If a coastal state is legitimately conducting weapons exercises, obviously for the safety of navigation, innocent passage can be temporarily suspended. And there's a number of other rules in terms of the application of relevant laws and regulations. Now, there are multiple different incidents that I could go through, but just some which are of interest. Uh, in 1992, Indonesia suspended the right of innocent passage for a Portuguese registered car ferry, which was on a voyage between uh, Darwin in Australia and Dili in what was then Indonesian East Timor. And the, the view that was taken was that this voyage of this uh, Portuguese registered car ferry was really an act of propaganda. It was not consistent with innocent passages I've outlined it for you, especially in Article 19 of the convention. So Indonesia just stopped that vessel and said, you cannot proceed into our territorial sea. Obviously uh, a, a, a car ferry had little capacity to resist that and ultimately turned around and returned uh, back to Darwin in Australia. Some Australian state practice is interesting here. I can go into that in a bit more detail in Q and A. Um, during Australia's towback operations of vessels seeking to bring asylum seekers to Australia, uh, Australia has towed certain vessels away from the Australian coast, but also towed them into the waters of Indonesia, um, apparently by error. But I would certainly argue that you cannot tow a vessel into the coastal waters, the territorial sea of another state. So moving then on to international straits, and predominantly when we think about international straits, though this is not the only way to think about it, we're really looking at bodies of water that are covered by uh, territorial sea. So these are bodies of water that predominantly, not exclusively, but predominantly are bodies of water that are less, that are less than 24 nautical miles in breadth. And so when we think about a strait, there's obviously a geographical dimension to it, but there's also a juridical definition. In other words, what does international law say as to what constitutes a strait? And especially under the Law of the Sea Convention, what is a strait within which the right of transit passage, as it's referred to in the convention, can be exercised? So part three of the Law of the Sea Convention talks about various different regimes that apply in straits. Um, the one that's most significant, I think, for us uh, today is, is the first, and that is the right of where transit passage can be exercised through straits. Uh, there are other mechanisms that apply there. Um, the second applies to uh, straits where there are long-standing convention regimes. There are a handful of those that fall into that category. So in terms of Article 37, which is the critical aspect uh, that deals with this right of transit passage, it refers to this geographic dimension of there being a strait. But secondly, the strait must be one that's used for international navigation, and it must be a body of water that connects one area of high seas or exclusive economic zone with another area of high seas or exclusive economic zone. So our international strait is very much an international highway, and the regime of transit passage is one that is really designed to facilitate the free movement of vessels uh, through that body of water from one area of high seas or EZ into another area of high seas or EZ. And that's where the Corfu Channel case test that I spoke about becomes important again, because it lays down this important test of there being both a geographic and a functional criteria. So a clear example of an international strait that was envisaged when the Law of the Sea Convention was concluded uh, was the Straits of Malacca and Singapore. Um, it clearly connects relevant bodies of water and it has very high volumes of international navigation passing through those straits on a daily basis. So what exactly is the right of transit passage? It's the freedom of navigation and also overflight. So that's an important point of distinction. That's not a, a right that's recognized in the case of innocent passage. For the purpose of continuous and expeditious of transit of the strait between one area of high seas and EZ and another. So the obligations upon a ship especially proceed without delay, refrain from any use of force and refrain from any activities which are not incidental to normal modes of transit. 
and straight states, the literal states, are not to hamper transit passage in those circumstances. Now, when the Law of the Sea Convention was concluded, that raised some interesting questions to what exactly were these straits, and Australia and Papua New Guinea concluded a treaty which acknowledged that this would be a strait through which the right of innocent pass transit passage would apply. But in the case of the Bering Strait, the strait that separates um, the United States and, and, and the Russian Federation, there was some uncertainty about that. And here you can see some of the interesting geographical features in the Bering Strait. There are two islands, Big Diomede and Little Diomede. One's Russian, one's American. Uh, there's only two uh, miles separating those two uh, islands. But there was a real issue as to whether or not the transit passage regime would apply uh, within those waters. And it was really only uh, in the uh, 2000s that it was accepted that yes, based on the number of ships that move between those uh, bodies of water uh, in the July, October period, which is when most international shipping occurs uh, in the summer and the uh, early autumn, um, that yes, the, the criteria of the Corfu Channel pay case was, was met. So my concluding points are that the navigational regimes that I've spoken about apply in the territorial sea. That's a, a critical classification, a critical characterization. Transit passage extends to both navigation and overflight. There's a very limited capacity on the part of a coastal state, the literal state, to close the territorial sea to innocent passage. No closure can occur of an international strait to transit passage, but nevertheless, we see some variable examples of state practice, and I'm happy to go into that in the Q&A. Thank you so much. Thank you very much, Professor, Professor Rothwell, for that great uh, introduction. Um, I have a bunch of questions, mainly what do we do with non-states, but I will keep that to the uh, Q&A. And again, I uh, encourage audience members to write your questions either in the chat or in the Q&A Q &A section, and we will get to that at the end. Uh, our next speaker is Dr. Stephen Blackwell. Dr. Blackwell serves as the scientific advisor and director of strategic studies for TRENDS. TRENDS is a global research and advisory center based at the United Arab Emirates and one which we at the Maritime Policy and Strategy uh, Research Center at the University of Haifa are proud to call our scientific partners in research. Uh, one of the many fruits of the Abrahamic Accords between Israel and the UAE, and we hope uh, it will continue in this vein. Uh, Dr. Stephen Blackwell is an analyst, researcher, and writer with more than 20 years experience in roles across the think tank, academic, and media sectors. He is the author of the book, British Military Intervention and the Struggle for Jordan, King Hussein, Nasser, and the Middle East Crisis between 1955 and 1958, which was published by Rutledge in 2012. He has also authored numerous journal articles and book chapters, as well as opinion and news analysis sections for The National, uh, Abu Dhabi's first English language newspaper. Before moving to the UAE, Dr. Blackwell was the head of the European Security Program at the Royal United Services Institute in London, and editor for Jane's Sentinel Security Assessments. He was also a lecturer at the University College of London. Dr. Blackwell, the floor is yours. Uh, thank you very much. Um, I'd like to uh, extend my thanks um, to uh, the, the organizers, uh, uh, HMS Conrad, Conrad Adenauer Stiftung and, and University of Haifa. Uh, it's, it's my great pleasure to join you. Uh, I'm just attempting to share my um, PowerPoint with you. I'm not very well versed in doing this kind of thing. Just bear with me a second. I, uh, I hope that's... that's uh, Yes, we see it. At least visible, yes. Okay. Um, basically, of course, the straight, uh, the straight of all moves is, um, is uh, of course, is, is well known as, a, a, as one of the key international choke points, an international strait uh, in which Iran and Oman claim sovereignty over its territorial waters. Um, uh, the Omani side is at the tip of the peninsula at the, in, in, in the east of the Arabian Peninsula, an exclave of Omani territory actually borders on the Straits of Hormuz. But overall, the strait is 90 nautical miles long with a, 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 a width of 21 nautical miles at its narrowest point. And its strategic and economic importance is, is evident from the fact that 
roughly one third of the world's liquefied natural gas, so one quarter of total global oil production passes through the through the strait. Um, uh, foreign, in terms of transit passage and instant passage, um, foreign vessels transiting the um, territorial seas, as 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 the previous speaker uh, outlined. Uh, Foreign vessels transiting the internet territorial seas and international straits are bound by the 1958 Geneva Convention and the uh, uh, 1982 uh, UNCLOS uh, agreement, of course, which, uh, in terms of international law, takes takes precedence over the over the uh, 1958 Convention. Um, in terms of Straits of Hormuz, third company shipping has the extensive right, as determined by UNCLOS, to transit the straits. Uh, however, as Iran has signed but not ratified on CLOS, Tehran reserves its position on the right of innocent passage through the straits, uh, with innocent passage, of course, being considered inferior to transit rights. Uh, Iran's sovereign rights as a coast, coastal state mean, also mean that the country can establish and enforce laws for territorial waters, though it cannot prevent passage through international straits, including for military vessels. Nevertheless, Iran's rights in its waters mean that duties of passage have to be observed by transiting ships. In relation to the Straits of Hormuz, these duties require ships not to threaten or use force against the littoral states. While military vessels have transit rights, they cannot use military force while passing through the strait. Um, an important recent, recent incident, uh, which sort of highlighted some of the issues uh, uh, in, in relation to these to these rights and the international legal status, uh, was the uh, Stena Impero incident in, in 2019, when uh, the vessel Stena, Stena Impero, uh, uh, which was belonged to a Swedish shipping company, uh, flew the British flag. Uh, was detained allegedly in the territorial waters of Amman, um, uh, arguably as a response to the British de detention of, of, the, of the tanker Grace One uh, near Gibraltar shortly before uh, this incident happened. Uh, Iran produced several reasons for the action, including a claim that the tanker violated navigation rules that the ship collided with an Iranian fishing vessel and that the detention was, was a countermeasure to the detention of Grace One. Nevertheless, given that Iran did not have the right to detain the ship in Omani territorial waters or on the high seas, the Iranian justification was, was at best questionable. Uh, according to Article 49 on the draft on state responsibility, uh, an injured state may take countermeasures only against illegal acts. Apart from the violation of obligations erga omnis, the violation must affect the state that avails itself of the right to countermeasures. And arguably, Iran's rights were not violated by the detention of Grace One, as this ship did not fly the Iranian flag. Um, so the question, uh, one of the questions that uh, arises from from these issues is, uh, of course, Strait of Hormuz has been seen as a potential flashpoint. Um, there's concern that a unilateral Iranian attempt to to impede or, or indeed stop freedom of nav navigation in the Straits would would be a, a, a casus belli. It would perhaps lead to to a military conflict. Um, in the case of Hormuz, or did the use of self-defense as a measure against attacks on commercial vessels uh, was discussed in the precedent of the, of the International Court, Court of Justice's uh, judgment on the uh, oil platforms case in the, in the 1980s. Um, in reality, the oil platforms judgment was ambiguous on whether or not attacks on commercial vessels could be considered armed attacks on the state on which, under which vessels attacked were flagged. An implication of the ICJ judgment was that attacks against military vessels were directed at the state itself, while in contrast, attacks on commercial vessels were, aimed, were not aimed against the state unless they potentially threatened the state's security interests. 
so the the ICJ judgment uh, rather left open the question um, of whether or, or an attack on a commercial vessel justified self defence. Uh, given the uh, potential uh, um, destabilizing impact of a, of, a, of a serious incident in the Straits of Hormuz or an attempt to close the Straits of Hormuz, um, the, and it, some form of international regi regime has, has been suggested as, as, as a solution and as perhaps a, given sufficient political will as a, as a system that might kind of um, some, surpass somebody's doubts and, and, and perhaps establish a, a, a multilateral mechanism which would uh, prevent any, any, any serious incident from arising. Um, of course, from an international legal perspective, it's difficult to justify the use of military force to protect shipping in territorial waters without a, a specific and explicit UN Security Council mandate. Um, of course, one way to, to avert such such a, a, an eventuality would be through a through a regional agreement uh, that would also include global maritime powers. Most importantly, of course, the United States, which would clarify the maritime laws as they as they apply to to shipping uh, transit passage and innocent passage in the Strait of Hormuz. However, an international military mission in the Strait to control navigation without the consent of Iran would be a violation of the law of the sea. And in addition, an international mission could be justified only as a countermeasure for the infringement of the right to unfettered uh, navigation, uh, assuming that Iran would seek to impede such navigation or, 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 present it for, or prevent it for, for whatever reason. Um, so uh, those are just my, my, the, the main points of my paper. Uh, um, and I'm, I'm, I'm happy to take uh, uh, questions and uh, um, I'll uh, pass back to the, uh, the, the panel chair. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Blackwell. That was right on time. Uh, excellent, that leaves us a lot of time for uh, Q and A. Uh, before we get to the Q&A, our final speaker uh, is Dr. and Advocate Benny Spanier. Uh, Dr. Spanier is a Senior Research Fellow at the Maritime Policy and Strategy Research Center at the University of Haifa, and he holds a PhD in Law from the University of Haifa. Dr. Spanier's uh, research focuses on international public law and maritime law, with an emphasis on international tribunals. Within the framework of our center, uh, Dr. Spania has published several articles and conducted research relating to Israel's maritime boundaries and how they correspond to the law of the sea. Dr. Spania is also a lecturer and teaches a course on the law of the sea as part of the center's master degree program uh, in national security and maritime strategy that we have here at the University of Haifa. He was previously a visiting lecturer at Syracuse University uh, at its School of Law in New York. Now, there's much more to say about Dr. Spanier, but that's all he sent me, which I think is an uh, indication of what, uh, how humble he is, because there's a lot more to say about him, but that's all he wanted me to say. So Dr. Spanier, uh, the floor is yours. Thank you, Eli, thank you. Uh, thank you, Eli, and thank you very much, everyone, uh, to invite me to this uh, webinar. First of all, I want to apologize for my English. Uh, not as everyone here, I'm not a native speaker, so thank you for that. Well, I'm going to speak about uh, the Strait of Tehran. In a minute, uh, we will see where it's located, from the peace agreement between Israel and Egypt to Unkelos. Uh, and thank you to Professor Rothwell that uh, made the, uh, life, my life much easier because he explained what is innocent passage and what is transit passage. Uh, the area we are talking about, here you can see the satellite uh, picture. So we are talking about, this is the Middle East, you can see Saudi Arabia, the Red Sea, uh, this is the Suez Canal. Uh, here in the yellow, uh, uh, in, in this uh, yellow uh, phase, you can see the Strait of Tehran, in a minute I will go into it. The, this is the Aqaba uh, or uh, Eilat, um, uh, see, 
you can see here Israel, Jordan, and as we said, and as I said, just a minute. Okay, so in this quad, in this uh, quarter, this yellow quarter, this is the Strait of Tehran. The Strait of Tehran um, is located in the end of the of the Red Sea. You can see here. This is uh, in the western side. This is Egypt. In the eastern side, it's uh, so today is Saudi Arabia. There, here is the two islands: the island of Tehran and uh, Snafir. Um, you can see here that uh, uh, the wide of the straits are between uh, in the 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 lane to the north is uh, something like. Uh, 900 yards and the, to the south is something like uh, 1300 uh, yards. So this is the area what, uh, where we are talking about. I saw that the best way to explain the uh, challenges of, of uh, this area regarding the regime of uh, the passage through the strait would be uh, by the chronological uh, timetable. So we will start in 19, we will do it very shortly. We will start in 1948. In this year, Israel got its independence from Britain. Egypt and Saudi were ruling the Strait of Tehran at that time. In 1948, a confidential agreement between Egypt and Saudi Arabia allowed uh, Egypt to bring military equipment uh, to the island. Uh, protect them from Israeli invasion. We don't know because we didn't saw this agreement. In the matter of fact, we don't really know if there is, if there is any agreement, and we don't know if uh, the Saudi if the Saudi Arabia just gave uh, the Egyptian the permission uh, to bring weapon or uh, also gave them uh, sovereignty. However, in 1955, Egypt uh, actively operated, closed the strait. Uh, to and from Israel, and as Professor uh, Choreb already said before in the in the beginning, uh, the Strait of Tehran for Israel is uh, crucial, and uh, closing them is uh, casus belli, as we see, will see in a minute. In 1956, joint operation with Britain and France, Israeli occupied the Sinai, the Sinai Peninsula, the Suez Canal, and uh, as well as the Strait of, uh, of uh, Tehran. Uh, a year later, in uh, 1957, Israel withdrew from the Strait of Tehran, returning it to Egypt, and Egypt is again uh, ruling the Strait of Tehran. Fair enough, in 1967, 10 years later, Egypt again closed the Strait of Tehran. I'm not getting into the reason, the political reason, the geostrategic uh, reason. Uh, this is not uh, our uh, main issue right now, but uh, we are, because we are looking at the uh, a regime in the Strait of Tehran. So in 1967, again, Egypt closes the strait to and from Israel. And this time in 1967, Israel again occupies the Sinai Peninsula as well as the Strait of Tehran. So what we see here is that in 1967, as already Professor Roswell said before, uh, the regime was the convention, the 19, uh, uh, 1959 convention, the, the Geneva Convention, uh, Article 16, uh, Paragraph 4. So uh, here you can see the uh, strait, here, down here you can see the strait of uh, Tehran. You can see that Israel is ruling both of the sides of the strait. And the regime in 1967 was uh, Innocent Passage. In 1979, um, peace agreement between Israel and Egypt. Uh, Israel again withdraw from uh, the Sinai Peninsula and Egypt controls the Straits. Now, this is very interesting because what happened in the peace agreement between Israel and Egypt was Article 5, Paragraph 2. The side decided that the parties considered the Strait of Tehran and the Gulf of Aqaba to be international waterway open to all the nation for an independent and non-suspendable freedom of navigation. So the side decided to upgrade uh, the regime uh, of the Straits from uh, innocent passage to freedom of navigation. This was uh, decided by the two sides, uh, but it was uh, very interesting because right now in 1979, the regime 
of the Strait of Tehran is not uh, innocent passage, but freedom of navigation. Fair enough, in 1982, as uh, already was explained before, um, we can see that uh, Onkelos became into power, uh, not into power, but uh, we have the Onkelos in 1982. And there, as Professor Rothwell already explained, the regime was transit passage one part of the, from one part of the high seas to uh, or exclusive economical zone to another part of the high seas or exclusive economical zone. Now, this is a, was a problem for the sides because as we, I already uh, showed before, this is uh, the Aqaba uh, or the Ilat uh, um, area. So what happened is that uh, for getting transit passage, you have to, you had to be between one uh, high sea to the other high sea, to the other high sea. The thing is that uh, this, uh, this is, the Red Sea is a high sea, but as we can see here, uh, the Strait of Tehran is uh, connecting between semi-enclosed of the Aqaba uh, area to uh, uh, Strait of Tehran. So in the, what happened is, that uh, the Strait of Tehran, according to uh, Unkelus, was downgraded from uh, freedom of navigation to innocent passage. This is a question because right now we have uh, some difficulties, but the story is not ended because in 2016, what happened is that the island went back. There was an agreement between Saudi Arabia and Egypt and the island went back from Egypt to uh, uh, to Saudi Arabia, and the thing is that there was not uh, not an here we can see it here. Okay, so the islands here and here went back from uh, Egypt, which uh, the regime was freedom of navigation. Now it became a two part uh, strait. One part is the Egyptian, the western part, and the eastern part is the Saudi Arabia. So the question was, where are we going from here? According uh, what is the situation with the Egyptian uh, is the question who is prevailing, the peace agreement or uh, the Unkelus? Uh, according to Article 311 and uh, most of the people and uh, I mean most of the scholars and Israel and Egypt and uh, the United States was part to this uh, uh, agreement the peace agreement is prevailing so in the uh, egyptian side the, the there is a freedom of navigation the question is what going to be uh, the situation with saudi arabia because saudi arabia is not part of the peace agreement and uh, when uh, ratifying the uh, unkelus they de made a declaration that the Kingdom of Saudi Arabia are not bound to any international treaty or agreement which contain provisions of uh, their land. Uh, this, uh, this uh, declaration was aimed uh, directly at the peace agreement between, between Israel and uh, Egypt. So now we have a question, at least of the half of the Strait of uh, Tehran, because uh, the situation with uh, Saudi Arabia is not very clear and we don't know where we are going from here. Uh, would it be uh, freedom of navigation as within the peace agreement or are we going back to innocent passage which is uh, as we saw before a very uh, problematic uh, thing for Israel hoping that uh, no one will close again the, this uh, strait. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Spaniel. Um, great, so we had our three uh, initial presentations um, and now I want to open it up for Q&A and discussion. Uh, Benny, if you can just take out the presentation um, mm -hmm. to stop the sharing. So um, uh, we have two excellent uh, questions in the Q&A from the audience. I will also start with my own kind of opening questions, open it up to everyone. Um, this is, this is Israeli style discussion. Uh, feel free to interject, to debate, to argue, right? Dialect, uh, friction creates uh, fire. 
so that's uh, that's how we can get our best uh, uh, kind of uh, highlights and understandings and insights. So I'll, I'm going to open it up for uh, a kind of a general question. I want each one of you to answer very briefly what you think, and then we will open it up for discussion if you want to answer one another or comment, okay? So my kind of general questions to each one of you, and I'll start with Professor R. Rothwell, is um, what do you expect the challenges, the major challenges to be in the upcoming years um, to the issue of innocent transit? Do you see the rise of maybe non-state actors as a major challenge? And if so, in what way? Um, conflicts in the area, uh, uh, the, the um, diminishing maybe of a superpower and the rise of another, what kind of challenges um, do, you, do all three panelists see as something that legal experts are going to have to increasingly deal with in the upcoming years when it comes to the law of the sea? Will I only one comment? Are you aware about the question in the Q&A in the chat? Yes, yes, we have two excellent uh, questions, one from okay. Shmueli Ushalmi and the other from Tariq Fayaz, which I'll okay. get to in a second. Okay. Thank you, uh, Chair. Uh, look, my, my quick response is that uh, I think we can see a lot of uh, uh, additional securitization of the territorial sea. Um, this year is the 20th anniversary of the 9-11 attacks on the United States, and I think during the past 20 years we've seen uh, a range of states around the world uh, adopt additional security measures within their territorial sea. And I think that's going to increasingly become a point of tension. Uh, we, of course, have um, uh, interpretations of the convention uh, that apply in the Asia Pacific, whereby China um, has a very strong position in terms of not permitting uh, foreign warships to enter its territorial sea uh, unless they do so without authorization or notification. So that's an example of, of that particular type of practice. Thank you. Thank you. Dr. Blackwell? Well, well in yes, in terms of the, uh, uh, the general outlook in the, in the, uh, in the Arabian Gulf, um, it, it, it's arguable that the, the current legal regime is is, is defective. Uh, I mean, obviously, it, it, Iran has uh, a sign on clause, but did not ratify it, and claims that its its national laws have precedence over over the existing international conventions. The United Arab, Arab Emirates, similarly, is, as has signed uh, on clause, but not ratified it. Um, the you know the, the potential uh, 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 of the Straits of Hormuz to serve as a flashpoint means that you know the, 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 the issue state is very high on the security agenda. Of course, there have been a number of incidents in uh, in recent months and years uh, that have somehow been discreetly managed. Uh, no one's quite sure entirely how, but uh, uh, attacks on shipping and and uh, and. Uh, been several several cases. Uh, fortunately, did not lead to a sort of wider es escalation. But uh, in, in terms of superpower rivalries, of course, the U.S. is the ultimately underwrite security in the Gulf, at least for the uh, um, for the export of uh, hydrocarbons, oil and gas. A lot of the the vast bulk of of oil and gas exports from the Gulf actually head to East Asia, uh, the Republic of Korea, Japan, and, and China. But it's the US that is primarily responsible for, for guaranteeing security. And, and perhaps uh, you know, amid all the speculation about the potential US withdrawal from the Middle East, there's no sign that that uh, would affect the US's kind of special security relationship with the Gulf states, but um, uh, you know how, how things might evolve, we can only speculate at the moment. But, but uh, of course, uh, lots of lots of interesting issues and potentially uh, serious issues that may arise. Thank you, uh, Dr. Uspania. The same question to you: What challenges do you see uh, coming uh, to the law of the sea, uh, and from where? Which regions? From which actors? Uh, will uh, legal experts in the law of the sea will have to deal with in the upcoming years? Thank you. Thank you, Eli. Uh, well, Israel is in the middle of a very uh, harsh neighborhood. 
regarding the law of the sea, but I'll concentrate on the Strait of Tehran. I think that I emphasize that the problem is in, in the Strait of Tehran is uh, mainly uh, with right now with uh, Saudi Arabia and uh, will it uh, confirm or not the peace agreement uh, with uh, Egypt. Uh, where are we going uh, to? It's a, a mainly a geopolitical uh, question. Um, the Strait of Tehran are very sensitive to Israel. Uh, every change there could be crucial. And hopefully uh, everyone uh, will uh, make everything that they could, that they can, that uh, the regime of innocent passage won't be uh, a, a cause to another incident of violent, violent uh, breakout. Okay, great. I want to refer to something that Dr. Blackwell mentioned. Um, there's kind of a tension here because on the one hand, you referred to the U.S. as kind of an enforcer of international law, of the law of the sea in the Gulf states. On the other hand, we see a lot of occasions where the U.S. itself, which is not a signatory right to UNCLOS, itself arguably violates some of these laws. This, this brings me to uh, one of the Q&A questions by Tariq Fayaz. Uh, I will read it out loud. Uh, in April 2021, a warship of the United States of America, the John Paul Jones, had sailed 130 nautical miles west of uh, Lakshadweep Islands. I'm sorry if I'm not pronouncing it right. Uh, that is within India's EEZ, without India's prior consent. The U.S. has not ratified uh, the UNCLOS, but says it observes it as customary international law. Question is, as a maritime power, uh, it is usually the U.S. which ends up sailing into other states' territorial waters or conducting military activity in their EEZ. What remedies do the victim countries, uh, it's interesting the use of the word victim, we'll talk about that, have in such cases? And can it be termed as innocent passage only? What about the sovereignty of the other states? Uh, anyone who wants to interject uh, and answer this? Yeah, look, I'm, I'm happy to jump in there. Look, I, I think it's, it's really critical that there's an understanding that there is very little capacity for a coastal state to regulate navigation within the exclusive economic zone. The only ability of a coastal state to regulate navigation within its waters uh, are principally, not exclusively, but principally within the bodies of water that we've been speaking about. The, the territorial sea where innocent passage applies and in international straits. Archipelagic states are another category. They're not relevant uh, in the Middle East region by and large. So any suggestion that a coastal state can regulate navigation beyond the 12 nautical mile limit uh, out to the edge of the 200 nautical mile exclusive economic zone is not consistent with international law. Now there is, there is an argument as to whether or not a literal state, a coastal state can prohibit military exercises. I emphasize military exercises as opposed to the navigation of foreign warships. Um, I think that's a separate question. Happy to answer that in another setting. Great, Dr. Spania or Dr. Blackwell, do you want to interject? I have nothing to add. Okay. Uh, yeah. Sorry, I, Dr. Blackwell. Uh, I, I, I think in the case of of, of the Arabian Gulf, uh, I mean the key precedent, the one which is constantly referred to, is the uh, is is the oil platforms case in the nineteen eighties, uh, and this, of course, was not was not strictly about a, a, a sort of some, any kind of sort of navigational violation of of conventions, but. Uh, about whether um, an attack on a on a commercial vessel um, was seen as as a, a given as applicable to whichever country that vessel was flagged under um, the, the the international court's judgment on 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 whether that constituted an, an armed attack it left a lot of ambiguity. Uh, the Iranian contention was that uh, it was, it was, well, there's some debate, uh, there's some of the facts are not entirely clear, but uh, a case where a, a tanker was struck by a missile, um, the, the Iranians, Iranian interpretation of the ICJ judgment was that that was not an armed attack, whereas the 
the, the the British embassy, the well, the British embassy at the at the at the Hague, which is which of course is closely involved in the in in the um, in the prosecution of the case, all these followed the case, uh, argued that that was an armed attack. So, you know, the the, the major precedent with regard to use of force and and um, uh, um, uh, military related incidents in the Gulf, there was there was, there was no clear precedent set. So one of the main critiques that um, is waged against international law and the law of the sea is that it is mainly directed towards states. Uh, and I'm wondering uh, your comments regarding the challenges of what do you do uh, with two phenomena that are becoming increasingly uh, more uh, uh, visible in this area, which is non-state actors that are uh, acquiring maritime capabilities, both offensive and non-offensive, um, both uh, shipping through these lanes and also controlling or potentially controlling areas, let's say like the Houthi in uh, Bab el-Mandeb. Um, adding to this is what uh, Gidon uh, Thibault said in our comments, autonomous vessels, uh, vessels where you don't really see the footprint of who actually sent them sometimes, you don't know who to attribute the passage of that ship, so what tools does the international law have, uh, law of the sea has to deal with these non-state actors and autonomous uh, vehicles? So a, a quick comment there. And of course, um, the law of the sea has historically dealt with non-state actors and they're called pirates. So, so there's, been, there's been a lot of precedent and, and a lot of issues in terms of dealing with pirates, not only historically, but of course, uh, in recent decades. So um, non-state actors, of course, can take multiple forms. Um, and from a navigational perspective, um, that's not really the, the critical issue. The, the critical issue really is whether or not a, a vessel, who, whoever operates the vessel, vessel uh, poses a threat to the interests of the coastal state. And of course, th th that can arise as a result of the actions of a state actor or, or a non-state actor. And to that end, uh, autonomous vessels fall into not a dissimilar category. A an autonomous vessel needs to be able to be flagged. It needs to be registered to be able to enjoy uh, freedom of navigation. Yes, there are a, a range of questions that arise in terms of navigational safety. That's regulated by another body of international law with principal oversight by the International Maritime Organization. So uh, I, I, think, I think we need to go back to some basic principles here to think about how some of these questions are addressed. Thank you, uh, Dr. Spaniel, Dr. Blackwell. Um, uh, for, I mean, from the Arabian Gulf perspective, um, uh, of course, there was, a, there was a great deal of concern that uh, the the uh, the growth of sort of, the, of instances of piracy off the Horn of Africa in the Gulf of Aden uh, a few years ago now, but that was seen as uh, as primarily a security concern, and it remains a security concern. Of course, a number of, of multilateral maritime missions were created uh, with, with, with the Europeans uh, and, the, and the United States involved to, to aim at piracy, suppression, and, and, and securing those uh, very important sea lanes passing through the Gulf of Aden and uh, Bab el Mandeb. And I... I I think it's still primarily seen as a security concern. I mean, where, where the international law might apply in these cases, um, um, it's difficult to see how at, at the moment. I mean, it, there have been some suggestions that that case that, that, that the instances of piracy could be could be referred to the uh, international criminal court. I'm not quite sure how that would apply, and of course, that brings up political questions of of uh, of you know who, which states are members of of the uh, of of the ICC and 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 how that applies to to non-state actors uh, to insurgents. Um, these these are I, I think are issues that have been raised, but are questions that are far from resolution. I I, I would suspect at the moment. I agree with uh, my colleagues, and I think that Israel uh, facing this kind of. Uh, uh, problem with uh, terrorist uh, ships uh, moving uh, weapons from uh, all kinds of countries to this area. Uh, it's not directly of a uh, matter of uh, regime or uh, 
choke points, but mainly how we deal with uh, these matters of moving uh, weapons uh, and security problems in uh, the seas. The visit, the right to visit of, by uh, warship, etc. So uh, th this is a really a challenge for the law of the sea, but uh, I don't think that it's uh, a matter of uh, 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 regimes of uh, navigation in the streets. Um, another major challenge that we have in this region, other than right, uh, what Dr. Spaniel just mentioned, is that um, on the one hand, we have rising tensions in the East Mediterranean, in the Red Sea, in the Gulf. On the other hand, we have key players in this region which are not signatories to the UN Convention on Law, Law of the Sea. Uh, Israel, Turkey, Syria, Iran is a signatory but has not ratified it. What do we do? How can we uh, push countries towards um, um, engaging more or even ratifying the UN Law of the Sea? Do you see the recent events as something that will push them even farther away from ratifying or even thinking about it or might push them together? Are recent tensions between Greece and Turkey, for example, are these an opportunity um, to get countries to sign the UN Law of the Sea or is that a pipe dream? I think one of the critical issues there are uh, uh, who, who are the champions for advancing uh, ratification of the law of the sea or in the case of some of the countries you mentioned uh, accession uh, of the law of the sea and you know um, I, I'd be happy to sprout the benefits of, of becoming a party to the law of the sea convention and critically um, it, it gives all states access to dispute resolution mechanisms that they're not able to access if they're not a party uh, to the convention. Having said that, um, my, my thesis would be that, that a great many of the provisions of the convention, certainly the ones that we're principally talking about today, uh, are reflected in customary international law. And to a degree that, that reduces the incentive for some states to move towards ratification, because certainly on the navigational issues, apart from some technical questions, um, by and large, most of the, the general freedoms of navigation and the rights of coastal states to regulate navigation, as we've been discussing, are fairly well accepted both under the convention and I would argue under customary international law. Thank you, Dr. Blackwell, Dr. Spania. I think, uh, again, to some extent, it comes, it comes down to uh, political issues, territorial disputes. I mean, in the Gulf itself, uh, there are some outstanding disputes over, well, for example, the Free Islands, Abu Musa and, and the Tums Islands, which, um, which are currently, well, from the perspective of the United Arab Emirates, are legally occupied by, uh, by Iran, a situation which has is, which is, uh, been in effect since, well, uh, almost exactly, for, uh, well, it'll be 50 years uh, in November this year. Um, so unless some of those political uh, disputes that relate to sort of demarcation of territorial waters uh, are, are, are resolved, that's, that, that's, that's something that's going to inhibit uh, full accession to UNCLOS. But uh, also I'd, I'd suggest that the, the, you know, the fact that the US has not ratified that, that also, um, I mean, really, for for UNCLOS to become more exclusive and more comprehensive, we need political will on 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 the part of the, of the major powers. I, I'm I'm sure if the US ratified, then then a, a, a number of, of 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 other countries would be would be inclined to follow. Um, I must confess, I, I I don't know what China's uh, status is in, in, ter in terms of its relation to UNCLOS, but of course that's a very uh, live issue, with, you know, concern, concerning its claims in the South China Sea. But it, it's it's almost like it, I think it's incumbent on the on, on on the on on the major powers, the great powers, if you like, to 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 set an example in terms of make, of making the convention work more effectively. Uh, thank you, Eli, for the question. I think that uh, we in the HMS, uh, as you know, uh, are doing a work. We believe that the uh, time has come that Israel will consider its uh, way of uh, not joining the UNCLOS, and maybe the time has come that uh, Israel should uh, join uh, this uh, convention. 
We believe that the American, the new uh, government in the uh, United States, Biden administration, in its uh, way of thinking, uh, the Paris uh, Convention, as uh, we, we all uh, saw, uh, maybe will change their point of view on the law of the sea. Uh, maybe they will join. Israel have few reason, very good reason, why not to join the, the convention, but uh, few reason, very good reason, why to join them. Um, we hope to uh, go on with this discussion and maybe uh, we will be able to uh, convince some of the political uh, um, persons in Israel to uh, think uh, and maybe one day will come and Israel will join the convention because I personally, I don't know, I, I, I know you didn't ask me personally, but I will say it. I think that is a, this is the right thing to do to join the convention. Thank you, Dr. Spania. Uh, Professor Rothwell, uh, regarding uh, Dr. Blackwell's comment, do you see a, a future, a near future, in which the U.S. ratifies uh, UNCLOS under the Biden administration? Thank you for that. And can I, can I just clarify, China is a party to the Law of the Sea Convention and has ratified the convention. Look, I've long taken the view that um, one of the incentives for the United States to uh, accede to the convention uh, is the current limitation, which I think it faces in terms of claiming a continental shelf beyond 200 nautical miles. The Law of the Sea Convention ha has a very important provision which allows countries which have broad continental shelf margins to uh, assert and make claims to a continental shelf beyond 200 nautical miles. I'm not of the view that that's reflected in customary international law. There's a provision uh, in the convention in which states uh, need to make submissions to the Commission on the Limits of the Continental Shelf. Uh, and the United States certainly would have a strong case uh, for continental shelf claims beyond 200 nautical miles. And I think that that creates an incentive for the US to move forward to accession. It's very interesting. Thank you, uh, Professor Rocco. Um, we are out of time. We have only two minutes left. Uh, and so if there are any other questions or comments that you want to address, uh, please write them uh, right away in the chat. Um, if not, then we will take a 10 minute break, right? Uh, Eli, Eli, can I uh, just uh, step in here? First of all, thank you. Um, if it's okay with everyone and, uh, and the panelists, in the interest of time, if we could all um, on our own time grab a glass of water uh, and we just continue without a break so we can condense it. We've got people in Australia, we've got people in the US. Is that okay? Uh, Judge Coricello, is that okay if we if we keep it going? Yes. Yes. Okay. So I encourage you all to have a nice uh, glass of water. Um, let me sum up the first panel as we move on to the second panel. First of all, Eli, thank you, thank you very much for your very um, enthusiastic uh, moderation of the panel. I think you've touched on on the key issues. Uh, it gets me excited to listen to all these different views. That's the beauty of academics, where everyone can really. Uh, step out and, 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 and touch on issues that are sometimes uh, not properly addressed or not well thought out. Uh, and these are times of change, technological change, a regime change, um, a new U.S. administration. Uh, Israel is not a party to UNCLOS, and I've already encountered the Benny's view and, and many others who think the time has come. Personally, I come from the area of energy, so I can relate to um, transit passage of LNG, of hydrocarbons, uh, which is all part of energy policies and part of the superpower kind of dynamics uh, over the seas. So, so thank you, Eli, and thank you to all the speakers. Um, so I'd like to move on now um, to the second panel. We, we've touched on the problems. We've seen how sometimes uh, the law of the sea is, is vague or can be challenged. Uh, by, by reality, by, by, by actual presence on the seas. Um, so what are the practical implications of these and, and what regulatory tools um, are available and lawful responses are available to, to coastal states when it comes to any violations? Um, so the first speaker on the second panel is, uh, is a great honor to, to have um, the Honorable Judge Ida Caracello on, on, uh, on this panel. Uh, she um, is a member of the uh, International Tribunal of the Law of the Sea, 
since October 1st, 2020. Uh, an, a legal expert um, uh, for the Italian Ministry of Foreign Affairs and a member of the Italian delegation for several bilateral negotiations with respect to delimitation of the continental shelf between Italy and Malta. Um, she has vast experience and I'm really summing it up um, as quickly as I can so we can hear her speak um, on uh, delimitation of maritime spaces between Italy and France and Italy and Greece. Uh, she's published articles on the legality uh, uh, on the use of force. Um, she's a she was or and is a full professor of international law in the Department of Political Scientists, Sciences at the University of Campania, Luigi Van Vettelli. Um, and of course, that's just uh, a grain of sand um, in her vast resume. So uh, Judge uh, Caracciolo, please, the floor is yours. Thank you, thank you very much. I, I wish uh, uh, to, to thank uh, the organizers of this webinar and so HMS uh, and the Konrad Adenauer um, Stiftung and the University of uh, Haifa and in the persons of Prof Professor uh, Korev and uh, Advocate uh, Scheffler. Uh, so the, the topic uh, I was assigned uh, is uh, uh, implication um, implications in the Eastern Mediterranean um, um, under the point of view of protection of innocent and transit uh, passage in maritime um, choke uh, points. Um, the problem, uh, uh, the, 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 the implications uh, are really uh, present really peculiar features in this uh, in this part of the Mediterranean uh, Sea because of various uh, reasons, uh, political and legal ones. I won't uh, dwell on political reasons; it's not my field of expertise. But I will try to uh, uh, offer an overview uh, um, on on. Uh, legal um uh, perspectives and, and, and point, uh, point of views. Uh, I think that uh, the um, implementation of uh, innocent passage and transit passage regimes in uh, East uh, Mediterranean is rather complicated because there are a lot of uh, peculiar uh, characterizing uh, elements uh, which uh, are involved uh, in this uh, implementation. Uh, first uh, of all, um, the uh, freedom of navigation through uh, choke points, uh, according uh, uh, to UNCLOS uh, rules, is not uh, um, an uh, uh, isolated problem within Eastern Mediterranean, but it it's an aspect of a larger uh, problem of uh, um, um, opposite uh, um, um, claims uh, on these uh, on, 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 on Eastern um, Mediterranean um, uh, Sea. Uh, uh, the the uh, the um, uh, the Mediterranean is uh, being a, an enclosed or semi-enclosed sea is characterized by um, overlapping, by disputes uh, uh, because of its uh, uh, so, so irregular uh, coastlines uh, and because of the presence of many islands of big, medium and little uh, dimensions everywhere uh, in that um, uh, basin. Uh, but uh, in the Eastern Mediterranean, and all these peculiarities are um, uh, aggravated uh, uh, by uh, strong um, divergences um, among uh, the states uh, in the region and by um, economic um, uh, interest. Uh, uh, such as those uh, concerning uh, uh, rights on hydrocarbons uh, offshore uh, fields and the uh, laying of uh, pipelines to, 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 to transport uh, gas from the Eastern Mediterranean basin uh, to Greece, Italy and other uh, European regions. I'm referring to, to the very well-known EastMed, uh, pr the, the project for uh, an East made uh, pipeline. 
pipeline uh, under the auspices of the European Commission and the financing of the European Commission uh, as well, uh, which uh, in a certain um, uh, way exas uh, has exacerbated the already uh, existing um, rivalries uh, among the states uh, in the uh, region. Um, so, of course, the regime, the application, the implementation of uh, uh, the, the transit passage and the innocent passage regimes uh, um, uh, is influenced by a uh, 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 other kind of tensions concerning uh, the sea uh, in that part of the Mediterranean uh, Sea. Um, the second um, um, character characterizing uh, element uh, um, is, in my opinion, given by the fact that Eastern Mediterranean is characterized by uh, different, uh, different categories of uh, um, waterways uh, and uh, choke points uh, within them. Um, we can really propose several classification of waterways in Eastern Mediterranean, each, uh, each uh, classification is a satisfying one. Uh, first, we can uh, classify the, um, uh, waterways uh, according to their legal nature under um, uh, UNCLOS. Uh, so we have uh, straits, we have international straits and um, uh, canals. Uh, but we can also classify them uh, taking into consideration their geographical uh, features. Uh, so we have uh, waterways which connect the Mediterranean Sea to other uh, seas and to the ocean, um, then the, the, the Indian Ocean in, in that part of the Mediterranean uh, Sea. Uh, everybody knows of of course, Bosphorus and the Dardanelles uh, on the one side and the uh, Suez Canal on, on the other. But uh, we have also many um, uh, stray uh, waterways, the, the, uh, either international straits, uh, uh, either uh, straits, but also canal, which I, I usually um, um, call inland or internal straits in the sense that they are more or less relevant for navigation within the uh, Mediterranean basin and in particular within uh, the, uh, uh, the eastern uh, Mediterranean um, uh, basin. Um, uh, let me uh, 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 Remember, for example, uh, the uh, many uh, straits within the Aegean um, Sea uh, between uh, Greek islands, but also between the Anatolian Peninsula and uh, the uh, Dodecanese uh, islands. Um, and um, indeed, uh, in 2010, uh, uh, a study conducted by the European Commission for the European Parliament presented uh, very interesting maps uh, on uh, Eastern Mediterranean. Uh, and uh, they, uh, the, uh, one of these maps um, underlines very well uh, the uh, many choke points within the Aegean um, uh, Sea, uh, except the two main choke points, uh, the Turkish Straits and uh, uh, the Suez um, uh, Canal. Uh, um, so uh, uh, it is, uh, let's say, uh, rather uh, um, um, uh, interest uh, are really uh, uh, interests really vary uh, from uh, one kind of waterways to the other uh, kind of uh, waterways. Uh, finally, we can also uh, uh, classify. Uh, the um, Eastern Mediterranean waterways taking into consideration the intensity of um, um, traffic, maritime traffic uh, within uh, these, through these um, 
uh, choke uh, points. Uh, we have uh, the uh, Suez Canal, which uh, has a global importance for maritime navigation and trade. Uh, the Turkish Straits are more uh, regional, uh, regionally relevant since they are of concern for uh, the Black Sea uh, coastal um, um, state. But we have also uh, um, waterways uh, relevant uh, for uh, um, internal or really local navigation like the Corinth uh, Canal. Uh, so uh, really, uh, I think that the Eastern Mediterranean um, um, show us uh, uh, an enormous varieties of uh, um, uh, uh, economic, uh, strategic, and legal uh, uh, implications uh, uh, in connection with uh, uh, navigation uh, through um, um, uh, straits. Um, uh, the, la the second uh, uh, legal um, um, characteristic of Eastern Mediterranean is that uh, the, uh, the, the two main um, uh, choke points, uh, the Suez Canal and the uh, Turkish Straits, are not submitted to the regime uh, uh, established by uh, um, uh, 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 Anklos uh, um, uh, for, for different uh, legal grounds, uh, of course. Uh, Bosphorus, the Bosphorus and the Dardanelles are uh, included within the category of uh, 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 straits uh, whose passage uh, is uh, regulated whole or in part by long-standing international conventions. In the case of uh, the Turkish Strait, the Montreux Convention of 1936, um, while the Suez Canal is uh, a canal, so is not included within the um, scope of application of part three, and so it is submitted uh, 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 as every canal to uh, the regime of waters uh, within the canal is uh, um, uh, located. Uh, and in the case uh, of, of the Suez Canal, everybody knows the uh, Constantinople Convention uh, of um, 1888. Uh, so um, I know that there are a lot of debates uh, on uh, the, uh, on uh, uh, whether uh, the, the, the regime of uh, um, especially uh, Turkish uh, straits uh, is more is closer to innocent passage or it is closer to uh, transit passage but I don't think that this kind of um, comparison um, are really uh, uh, useful uh, indeed it is a very um, uh, ancient uh, convention it is a convention which uh, uh, um, submit uh, the navigation through the Turkish Straits to the control for security reasons and um, to uh, to Turkey uh, and so uh, there is a freedom of passage uh, but uh, the coastal state uh, has uh, an incumbent role uh, in, in organizing uh, the passage uh, and uh, of course uh, the, the for the Suez Canal we can say um, similar we, we can reach similar conclusions since uh, uh, the uh, uh, convention of eight, 1888 uh, gives uh, uh, the coastal uh, state uh, some uh, control. It is not um, uh, an, an internationalized uh, regime uh, uh, as uh, we could think nowadays uh, uh, in, in similar, um, um, we, we could envisage nowadays in similar uh, situation. Uh, then uh, the, the, the scenario is not uh, uh, um, um, uh, is, is even uh, larger uh, since we have a big struggle between uh, the application of innocent passage or transit passage in the Aegean uh, uh, Straits. Um, we know that we have uh, some uh, straits within the Aegean Sea which uh, are under, should be under the transit passage. Uh, but, and we know that there are uh, other uh, straits which are uh, straight um, 
uh, allowing uh, innocent passage. But uh, uh, um, uh, to conclude, uh, we have to uh, take into consideration the position of uh, Greece to that uh, end. Uh, Greece um, uh, tried during the third conference on the law of the sea to uh, modify uh, the regime of um, uh, transit uh, passage or the regime which would uh, uh, become uh, the regime of transit passage um, uh, uh, um, in uh, in a more um, in, in order to let it more favorable for a coastal state, but unsuccessfully. Uh, so at at the end, Greece uh, um, uh, deposited an, 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 an uh, interpretative uh, declaration uh, um, uh, while signing, and then it reiterated uh, at the time the, the, the same declaration at the time of ratification, which I find rather uh, interesting since in um, geographical uh, 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 Greece re um, uh, retains that in geographical um, um, sea where there is a widely uh, uh, spaced uh, islands uh, creating a larger number of straits, but which serve uh, a single route for international navigation. So they are um, uh, uh, different doors, but to, 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 to pass in the same, to enter the same um, uh, area. The coastal uh, state is responsible for uh, designating uh, the route or uh, routes uh, through these different uh, straits. Um, in order uh, to uh, uh, maintain the requirement of uh, international f the, of international navigation and uh, satisfied but at the same time uh, giving a minimum of, of uh, minimum safety uh, for vessel uh, and, um, uh, um, and air aircraft and for the coastal state uh, itself so to uh, to conclude uh, um, uh, the, the Eastern Mediterranean gives uh, uh, evidence uh, uh, that uh, um, the regime uh, for uh, international straits uh, um, has not uh, um, uh, uh, yet a uh, full of complete uh, adherence uh, in coastal state uh, practice uh, and that uh, um, uh, the, 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 the states uh, 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 tend to um, uh, uh, apply uh, internal rules, uh, domestic uh, rules, uh, and uh, try to uh, protect uh, in a stronger uh, way their uh, national uh, interest. Uh, um, uh, and so uh, not fully complying and sometime with the UNCLOS and sometimes uh, uh, acting contra legem vis-a-vis uh, -vis, uh, UNCLOS. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, Judge Caracciolo. Um, I think it's interesting the way you, you worded it, where, where at first you say that peculiar elements are involved in the implementation of UNCLOS and then those peculiarities are aggravated by the politics and economic rights of the coastal state. And that pretty much, the way I, I view things, sums up what's going on right now in the Eastern Mediterranean. Uh, we'll talk about it more in, in Q&A. So thank you very much for, uh, for your words. Um, the next uh, speaker is um, Dr. Natalie Klein. Um, Dr. A professor is a professor of international law at the University of um, New South Wales, is that UNSW, uh, where she served as the uh, Dean of the Macquarie Law School between 2011 and 2017, as well as acting head of the Department for Policing, Intelligence and Counterterrorism at Macquarie uh, in 2013 to 2014. Um, Professor Klein has a focus on the law of the sea and international dispute settlement. Uh, she provides advice, undertakes consultancies, and interacts with the media on the law of the sea. Uh, previously, 
worked um, in the field of arbitration at the law firm of De Beauvoise in Plimpton um, and was counsel to the government of Eritrea uh, and a consultant in the Office of Legal Affairs at the United Nations. Her master's and doctorate in law were earned at Yale Law School and she's a fellow of the Australian Academy of Law. Uh, Dr. Klein, professor, please. Thank you very much. I'm just looking to share my screen, which hopefully I have managed to do. And I would like to uh, join with the other speakers in thanking uh, you for the invitation to participate in this uh, webinar. It's certainly an honor to be able to speak and to hear the different views. And in some respects, my presentation is going to be building on those from uh, the first panel. And I'm going to be looking uh, more specifically at issues related to there we go. Um, responses when there are violations of passage rights and looking very much at some of the legal rules that kick in here and some of those were, were touched on by the previous speakers. And one of the things that I think is very interesting when we start talking about responses to passage violations under UNCLOS is that when it comes to the right of innocent passage, the drafters of the convention anticipated that the right of innocent passage would be violated and that they did actually set up a rule that would be put in place to respond to those violations of innocent passage. But also we have to start thinking about some rules of general international law and also look at some of the practice that's been followed in relation to uh, the use of escort uh, to protect passage and law enforcement and self-defense. So a lot to cover in 10 minutes, uh, but I'll give you the high level view and uh, we can go into more details in the questions. Now, as I mentioned, when we start talking about uh, responses to violations of the right of innocent passage, uh, Professor Rothwell mentioned in his presentation that Article 25 does anticipate that the coastal state can take necessary steps to prevent passage that is not innocent. But that, of course, begs the question as to what those necessary steps might be. So commentators have offered a range of different views on this. They have referred to the possibility of just seeking further information from the ship about its flag status, its route, excuse me, and its purposes. There may be subsequent me measures which would extend to warning communications, warning shots, going so far as interdiction, boarding and inspection of the vessels. Uh, vessels that are in violation of the right of innocent passage could be diverted, they could be expelled from the territorial sea, or they could be ordered into port. Uh, there is an anticipation as well that potentially because of the sovereignty that the coastal state exercises over its territorial sea, that it could potentially use necessary and proportionate force to seize or even sink a vessel if it has violated the right of innocent passage, though. Um, a lot will ultimately always depend on the circumstances of any particular situation. Article 25, paragraph 3 also anticipates a further response to violations of the right of innocent passage, allowing possibly for a temporary suspension of innocent passage. But in doing so, it is not to discriminate in form or in fact against any particular foreign ships. We also have to draw a distinction in terms of our responses, uh, in terms of what a coastal state may do for a private or commercial vessel that has violated the right of innocent passage compared to the warship. So in terms of the necessary steps to prevent passage, those are actions that can be taken against private vessels. If we're talking about warships or government vessels operated on non-commercial service, then all the coastal state can require under Article 30 is that those warships or government vessels leave the territorial sea immediately. So the rights of response then is much more limited because of the sovereign immunity that is enjoyed by warships and other government vessels in this circumstance. Now, when we turn to responses under UNCLOS for a possible violation of the right of transit passage, the situation is a little bit different because UNCLOS does not tell the coastal state what its responses might be. So we do need to look to general international law. What we see from the provisions in UNCLOS in relation to transit passage is really that um, the, the states um, that border uh, international straits can adopt laws and regulations, but really there are 
there are not that many steps that they are, they are permitted to take when a state has violated the right of transit passage uh, within UNCLOSE itself. This is why I mentioned we need to look more broadly beyond the specific duties that they have and the rights and obligations to consider uh, the other steps that it might be able to take. So if we turn to more general international law provisions, then uh, we have to note, first of all, that when there is a violation of the right of innocent passage or transit passage, that protest does remain an important response. So the, there's value in a diplomatic protest in as much that a state is communicating through formal channels what its particular position is, and that that can be sufficient uh, in responding to um, another state's uh, potential violation of passage rights, and certainly can be important for demonstrating a lack of acquiescence in the particular actions of a state. But if steps go further than merely a written protest, and often states will feel that more action is needed. If we are talking about possibly just an unfriendly act, but an act that is still lawful, then we are talking about retorsion. And retorsion is an unfriendly act that does not amount to a violation of international law. And we could potentially put the US freedom of navigation operations in this category as they are perceived by some states uh, that find themselves on the receiving end of those activities. But if the response uh, does potentially violate international law, then it may still count as a lawful countermeasure. And this was something that Dr. Blackwell mentioned in his presentation. So when a state believes that its rights have been infringed, this violation of international law may entitle the injured state to engage in countermeasures to induce compliance by the state that has acted unlawfully. So the countermeasure entitles the injured state to take action that may itself violate international law, but the preceding unlawful act constitutes a circumstance precluding wrongfulness for that state's actions. The difficulty once we start talking about countermeasures under the law of state responsibility is that there are a lot of different criteria that need to be met. The countermeasures need to be non-forcible, they need to be directed at the responsible state and not at third states. The countermeasures have to be temporary in character and as far as possible be reversible and they also need to be proportionate. In the International Law Commission's work on this topic, they also indicated various procedural requirements that before a state take countermeasures, that it should make it a demand to the injured state, from the injured state to the responsible state, that it comply with its obligations and also offer to negotiate and then potentially suspend the countermeasures if the wrongful act has ceased and the matter is before an international court or tribunal. So there is that possibility for countermeasures, but I think the point that I wanted to underline here is that uh, the requirements are very strict. And so the resort to an unlawful act must be deliberate and must be fully justified on the part of the injured state. Now, what we also see for states wanting to respond to potential violations of rights of uh, passage uh, is to use escort. And when I'm referring to escort, this is the possible use of military vessels accompanying uh, merchant shipping through particular areas of water. Now, the issue of escort has come up before both the International Court of Justice in the oil platforms case, and also in the South China Sea arbitration under uh, a dispute between the Philippines and China under UNCLOSE. And the question about the legality of the escort was not directly before each of these courts, but neither of them opted to actually address escort as something that was unlawful in its own right, but instead they looked at the consequences that flowed from uh, the escort having occurred. So rather than whether escort itself is lawful or not, we seem to start from a position that escort is allowed, but what we need to think about is whether it's a violation of the right of innocent passage or not. And views have really differed on this particular point. On the one hand, uh, we can argue that the presence of warships escorting civilian merchant vessels really implies the use of force to protect those vessels under escort. And so it is a threat of the use of force to some extent. Or it could be said that really escort is not an activity having direct bearing on passage, which again goes to some language in Article 19 that we heard from Professor Rothwell's presentation. 
So on those interpretations, we would say that escort uh, would be a violation of the right of innocent passage. But the alternative view, which is probably one that I would favor, would draw more so on the Corfu Channel case, which we've also heard about uh, in the previous panel. Because in that particular case, the court did not have regard to the surrounding political tensions or the United Kingdom's stated intention that it wanted to test the resolve of Albania when it sent its warships through uh, the Corfu Channel. Instead, what mattered uh, the, was what those warships actually did while they were traversing the Corfu Channel. So if warships sail through the territorial sea continuously and expeditiously, and they do so um, uh, at the same time as the merchant shipping, then arguably that is consistent with the right of innocent passage. The difficulty we have here is that it's really the subjective view of the coastal state, I think, that counts quite a bit. And determining what is a threat of the use of force will always be a fairly difficult one to uh, determine. Uh, then we have the question of whether escort is a violation of the right of transit passage. So here what we need, really need to think about is whether it falls within the normal mode of a warship. And here we could argue, well, a warship can certainly conduct uh, escort when it's on the high seas. That's a normal mode of its operation. So therefore it can do it while it is traversing uh, international straits as well. But in doing so, it still has to meet the requirements of transit passage, again, that the passage is continuous and expeditious, and once more, that it does not threaten the peace, good order and security of the literal state. So I think really the outstanding question around the use of escort is really whether the mere presence of the warships um, ready to use force threatens the peace or not. And if it is perceived to threaten the peace, then it would be a violation of those particular rites of passage. So there can be other responses when there are violations of um, the rites of passage. And we should note that the coastal state has law enforcement jurisdiction within its territorial sea, and especially under articles 27 and 28 of UNCLOSE. Uh, also in relation to um, the international straits. There's no explicit law enforcement powers that are set out. It merely refers to foreign ships um, that have to exercise, uh, that are exercising the right of transit passage comply with such laws and regulations. So we have to draw an argument here that where the coastal state has prescriptive jurisdiction that it's also allowed to enforce its laws. And certainly in the Arctic Sunrise Tribunal, when uh, that tribunal was considering a similar legal frame in relation to the continental shelf, it reached the conclusion that where there were prescriptive powers for the coastal state, it would also have enforcement powers. So perhaps the same conclusion would be reached here. But really what I think is most important once we start talking about exercising law enforcement powers within the territorial sea, is asking yourself, well, what are the actual national laws that are in place and what authorizations do they give the coastal state in those particular situations? We also have to acknowledge the possibility of the use of force that might happen during law enforcement operations. And this issue has arisen before the International Tribunal for the Law of the Sea, and it's observed that the use of force must be avoided as far as possible and where force is unavoidable, it must not go beyond what is reasonable and necessary in the circumstances. So efforts have to be made to hail the vessel or to fire across its bow before resorting to direct force against the vessel. And methods other than gunfire are to be preferred, whether it's through maneuvering, whether it's through the use of high pressure water hoses or potentially fouling propellers. And we also have to bear in mind that there are boundaries to the level of aggression and that guidance should also be sought from the Safety of Life at Sea Convention and also the coal regs or the international regulations on collisions. The Chinese Society of International Law uh, in its response to the South China Sea arbitration suggested that in the heat of law enforcement actions then the coal regs no longer applied, uh, but that position seemed untenable and was not accepted uh, by the South China Sea arbitration. Now, Finally, where there are instances beyond law enforcement that warships or other government vessels may resort uh, to force. 
And here I want to draw on the work of Cameron Moore, who has recently published a book on the freedom of navigation and the law of the sea. And I think one of the things that Cameron does, which is very helpful in his work, is distinguish between unit self-defence and national self-defence. And it does help to explain some of the um, decisions that were being made by the ICJ in the oil platforms decision, as well as the Nicaragua case. So when we're talking about unit self-defense, this is the immediate defense of the warship, task group, or vessels which they're escorting and may occur only against targets which pose an immediate threat. And in the situation of unit self-defense, then of course requirements around necessity and proportionality are key criteria that we apply. Otherwise, uh, we are potentially dealing with a situation where the use of force is so grave that it amounts to an armed attack, perhaps precipitating a national decision to engage in self-defense or decisions to engage in collective self-defense. So at that point, we might arrive at a situation of armed conflict. And further to one of the comments in the chat before, even when there's an armed conflict, international law remains relevant because then we are turning to the law of naval warfare. What is noticeable in some of the case law and a point that Moore makes in his work is that the threshold to reach an armed conflict at sea and to have the law of naval warfare apply is quite a high threshold, then we are more likely to be operating within the realm of unit self-defense before uh, we get to that stage. Uh, so just a few different scenarios to consider, and I think much will ultimately depend on the specific facts, the location of the vessels and the types of the vessels uh, involved. But what I really wanted to highlight is that there are legal rules that we can turn to, and it is particularly clear when you start looking through all those rules about responses to violations that necessity and proportionality remain critical criteria in responding to passage violations and that foremost, we should also remember um, observations made by both the International Court of Justice and the International Tribunal for the Law of the Sea, that considerations of humanity apply at sea, and those considerations should also inform state decision making. So thank you for your attention. I look forward to the discussion. Thank you very much, uh, <clears throat> Professor Klein. Um, with uh, your uh, lecture on the rules of, of response, uh, necessity and proportionality uh, and considerations of humanity. Um, unfortunately for us in Israel, um, we are often uh, challenged with these questions, whether at sea or whether not at sea. Um, and from people who are on the ground and have to make these types of decisions, um, sometimes the international rules of law um, are not clear enough or are too widely broad um, to be able to comply. Um, you discussed consequences of uh, escort um, and the question of whether escort uh, is a violation of an innocent uh, passage, if it's a violation of uh, transit passage, the use of force, the, the requirement for uh, proportionate use of force, non-deadly, and you described unit self-defense um, which is basically the immediate defense of targets that pose an immediate threat within proportionality of an armed attack. So that in itself is the topic of the seminar. Um, thank you. We'll, we'll move on to the next speaker, um, Dr. Uh, Aris Margelis, um, holds a PhD in public international law with a special, specialization in the law of the sea from the University of Nantes, France. He has taught the law of the sea, uh, geopolitics and international relations at the French Naval Academy uh, and the University of Western Brittany. He's currently an associate researcher at the Center of Maritime and Oceanic Law of the University of Nantes. His research focuses mainly on the international relations aspect of the law of the sea on delimitation issues in the Eastern Mediterranean, as well as maritime geopolitics. Aris, the floor is yours. So hi from Athens. Can you hear me well? Yes. Great. Very much. <clears throat> so um, I will share the screen. Uh, so my in uh, hi from Athens, first of all, and many thanks for the opportunity to participate to this webinar. 
uh, I will, uh, my presentation will be far more general than the previous uh, speakers. I will deal with the big picture and uh, focus on the general approach and the spirit uh, of UNCLOS with regard to military issues. Uh, so, first of all, something that is uh, quite well known, given the importance of uh, the oceans by every aspect in uh, international life, of course, uh, UNCLOS, uh, which is a text that governs these oceans, is uh, something more than a typical uh, regular convention. It practically uh, becomes a central piece uh, of international order. So, here we have a main, main uh, basic dichotomy because you have a static text that is Anglos that actually applies to international relations, which are by definition uh, moving and uh, evolving. So the text may remain the same. Uh, international relations are never the same. They are not the same in 1982, not the same in 1994, and not the same today. So how to overcome through Anglos uh, this basic dichotomy? Actually, you have a quite simple approach in Anglos. Uh, that is based on, on the one hand, what we could call the hard provisions, and on the other, the soft provisions. So the hard provisions are uh, those provisions who actually uh, provide no ground for competing interpretations. So these are the strong principles, which uh, actually are the pillars for UNCLOS to be well-grounded in international relations. They provide also something that is uh, very important in, in international law, that is common language, that is that all the parties to the convention will understand in the same way um, a provision or a principle. And at the end, uh, these hard provisions or principle uh, create the framework, the legal framework, which at the end will allow to distinguish what can be acceptable from what can be unacceptable as a claim. Then you have what you could call the soft provisions or principles, which uh, are complementary to the hard provisions, not opposite to them, and which are actually <coughs> uh, deliberately structured in a way as to allow competing interpretations. So why this? Because this uh, helps the UNCLOS to actually uh, integrate uh, the diversity and the complexity of the world to which it applies. So in, some, in a way, we could say that um, the soft provisions allow UNCLOS to, um, how to, say, to absorb the impact of the very natural uh, interstate competition. And moreover, this creates a space within international law for this natural and expectable interstate competition to manifest in the most secure uh, and the less chaotic possible way. So, of course, given the global scope uh, of UNCLOS, if we had only hard provisions, uh, that would be very easy to distinguish uh, what is legal from what is illegal, but actually that would be uh, absolutely detrimental uh, to the efficiency and, and the applicability of UNCLOS and to the adherence of uh, the state parties to UNCLOS. So uh, this applies, this very basic logic applies actually to two main fields which involve the interstate uh, relations. The first is the limitation, so I won't go to, through this because it's not the very topic, but again we have seen that uh, it is related in some way in this Mediterranean. The limitation is related also to questions of navigations, to questions of navigation. So you have this uh, same basic rules that are accepted by everyone, so you cannot argue on the maximum extension of EZ. It's, uh, if you go to 201 nautical mile, the one is objectively legal. But within this framework, uh, you will have uh, more imprecise, ambiguous notions like equity, which allow actually the states to compete uh, safely. And uh, this allows also international law uh, of the sea to take into account the diversity uh, of the possible situations. So. If we go to military issues, uh, for instance, in the rights of passage, we have again the two very basic principles. This has been explained very well today. So in UNCLOS, uh, we have the right of in, uh, innocent passage, of transit, of archipelagic passage, and the freedom of navigation in the high seas. 
on the one hand. On the other, you have uh, the obligation to respect the coastal state security. Uh, and in between, you will have some uh, provisions that actually provide the states with some freedom of uh, interpretation and of action. Uh, and actually, the outcome of the application of these uh, provisions is not necessarily well predictable, and it depends highly on who will uh, apply them, where, and when. Uh, for instance, uh, you have the possibility for the states to exclude from uh, international adjudication uh, military issues, uh, or also you have the sovereign immunity, which is a very, very, very well grounded principle in international law, which are generally um, provisions that are more in favor of the naval, country, the naval powers. And you have also the ability of the coastal state to qualify as non innocent uh, any passage any action uh, that is not related to the passage, and that same coastal state may require the warship to leave immediately. Uh, so again, we see that uh, the conjunction of these provisions leaves quite enough space to the states to manage the way <clears throat> in which uh, they will uh, be applied. Regarding the military activities, uh, which is a normal military issue in the EZ, again, we have the two very basic uh, principles, that is the freedom of navigation, in that case, in the high seas, and the coastal state security and peaceful use of, of oceans. And here we have a quite important degree of ambiguity. Uh, there are competing interpretations. I don't say that this is my opinion, but on the one side, we don't know, at least it's not written, in Amplos, if uh, military activities, for instance, are part of the freedom of navigation, of course, the United States and Western countries in general consider this as part of freedom of navigation, but there are developing countries that uh, do not necessarily accept this. Moreover, we have regarding the marine scientific research, we have a whole part in Amplos, but actually we don't have a clear definition. So uh, mainly developing countries consider that uh, both uh, research uh, that is uh, of economic and military interests are uh, the same. So both has to be subject to the coastal state jurisdiction. And of course, the United States that uh, consider that the military uh, research is something different that has not to be under the jurisdiction of the coastal state. And also, you don't have an explicit uh, authorization or prohibition of uh, international gathering. Uh, intelligence of, sorry, uh, military intelligence gathering. <clears throat> so why this uh, lack of clear definitions? Actually, uh, states are traditionally very reluctant when it comes to military issues to um, submit these issues to a very extended regulation or refinement or codification because military issues are the very heart of the state sovereignty and they are the tools, especially for military powers, uh, for for the regional or global action. So you don't want this very tool of your uh, global politics, especially with uh, regard to the United States, to be subject um, to regulation, especially through a convention, uh, international convention that is binding. Um, <clears throat> so uh, moreover, this uh, imprecision actually invites the balance of power in the legal equation. And this, again, is in favor of the naval powers. Uh, because, of course, when you are a strong military power, the balance of power is in your favor. And who says in precision, says also freedom. And uh, as we know, uh, to benefit from freedom, you need also to have the means to benefit from freedom. So the most, uh, st the stronger you are, the less regulation you need and you want because this leaves you the space to use the means you have and benefit from freedom to the opposite when you're a small or weak militarily speaking country you will seek uh, most more regulation in order to try to contain uh, the use of freedom from uh, military powers we have seen this for example in 1958 at that time the soviet union was not a naval power but the united states were already so uh, the Soviet Union was against the right of innocent passengers of warships, but the United States were in favor. So, uh, regarding the perspectives, <clears throat> I would raise a first question that is, 
if a further codification on refinement um, of uh, the provisions regarding military issues is possible. Okay, this has been quite well addressed today. Uh, there are some ways, there would be the conventional ways, way that is uh, an closer vision, which is theoretically and technically possible, but absolutely unlikely, at least in my opinion, because you need the degree of um, global uh, consensus that is today unrealistic to reach, or not in the 70s anymore. The second way would, you, would be jurisprudence. It is again possible, and we have, uh, I think, a quite interesting example with the 2019 ETLOS decision uh, on the Ukraine vs. Russia case, where actually in the Strait of Ketch, uh, Russia uh, captured Ukrainian military vessels and their crew, but this was considered not as a military issue by ETLOS, but as a, as a navigation issue. So here there is quite interesting thing, in my opinion. Uh, is that it may create uh, the legal ground to actually to shrink what can be considered as military issues. And this means that it also shrinks the scope of Article 298 on the ability, on the right to exclude from international adjudication military issues. So uh, what you can exclude from, from international adjudication uh, shrinks. So in a way, it is like decreasing uh, uh, a freedom of uh, the naval powers. And another way could be also bilateral arrangements. Um, I think this has been uh, dealt in the, in the first panel. It is, of course, technically, technically possible. We have an example uh, between the United States and the Soviet Union in 1989, following uh, two incidents uh, related to the passage of an American warships of two American warships in the Soviet Territorial Sea of Crimea, uh, following which uh, both countries <clears throat> actually issued a joint declaration on the common interpretation of the right of innocent passage for warships. The second question that I would raise is actually for further codification or refinement of uh, the provisions related to military issues would be beneficial, not only possible, but beneficial. Well, uh, Codification is basically a positive phenomenon uh, because codification brings predictability and predictability in international law uh, brings security. And this is very important uh, to the states. However, uh, in the case of UNCLOS, uh, this ambiguity uh, is uh, absolutely necessary. It is actually a structural part of UNCLOS uh, and it is a virtuous element as far as it is used wisely. So uh, this can have this ambiguity, this imprecision may have negative effects if actually the very basic principles are not observed anymore. And if we take the example of uh, the United States and China in, their EZ, in the Chinese EZ regarding military activities, uh, we will see that the United States considers that China is violating the very basic principle of the freedom of navigation in the high seas. But conversely, China uh, believes that the United States violate the very basic uh, principle of the security of the coastal states by performing military activities in the Chinese EZ. So both see to the other threat. So this means that um, in this context, of course, the imprecision will uh, be a part of the problem. Uh, however, here we may raise a question on if the good answer to give to such a situation is to shrink, to decrease the ambiguity in the legal way. Uh, I think it's a, I don't have the answer, but I think that from the moment this is mainly a political and strategic issue, and this applies also to the Eastern Mediterranean, for instance, or to some issues with Iran, certainly at a regional scale, uh, the answer has also to be political and strategic. So. I don't think that acting legally on that uh, will be uh, the, the, the best answer to, so, to solve the issue. So I will uh, finish with that. This uh, imprecision, this structural imprecision of UNCLOS on some issues is, leaves actually a precious space for the, the safe uh, exercise of freedom uh, on the behalf of the state parties. And actually it ensures to an important degree the wide and lasting adherence to the rule of law at sea. So uh, the question is, uh, if we shrink this space, too much at least, uh, this may, uh, on the long term, 
erode also the, um, the adherence to the rule of law at sea. So, many thanks. Thank you very much, uh, Aris. Um, <clears throat> you spoke about the spirit of UNCLOS on military issues, um, stating that international relations are always changing and on the move, but the text uh, stays the same. So you ask, what can we basically do? And you introduced an algorithm distinguishing between hard provisions and soft provisions. Um, and also interestingly, you stated that ambiguity is actually a part of UNCLOS and it serves uh, in favor of naval powers. Um, and the stronger you are, the less, the less need you need, the, the, the less need there is for regulation. And, and this brings me to um, Benny's uh, uh, lecture just before we started the second panel with regards to the strategy of uh, signing UNCLOS or not signing UNCLOS. Which position is, is, is better? Is it better not to sign and to avail yourself of regulation and then to cherry pick what you choose to follow or such as China to sign and then to choose which regulation you choose not to follow based on your own interpretation. So uh, it's a strategic question. It's, it's a really interesting issue you touch on. Um, and it seems to me that the world is so uh, diverse and there are so many issues that um, perhaps bilateral or regional or trilateral agreements, as Judge Coricello spoke about, for example, the AGNC, or perhaps a specific regime for passage through the Suez Canal is more applicable and more enforceable than a general convention addressing all the issues all over the world. So that's food for thought. Um, thank you, Aris. Uh, I'd now like to open the uh, discussion to any of the uh, listeners. So if you have any questions um, or if you'd like to say anything, please uh, send me um, those questions to the chat. Uh, the first question I'd like to ask uh, is, um, it was basically formed in the previous panel, but it's applicable here, is the distinction between freedom of navigation and why is that lower? Uh, considered a lower level than innocent passage. Um, shouldn't it be more restrictive, perhaps, uh, like in the China Sea? Um, please, any of you who'd like to answer that question. Um, starting, let's start with Judge Caricello. Um, yes, well, um... The, the concept of freedom of navigation, in my opinion, is an extremely uh, uh, wide concept. So we do not have uh, a freedom of navigation. We have various freedoms of navigation. We have uh, an ex the, the greatest example possible, which is the freedom of navigation on the high seas. But we have navigation uh, declined in different way in different maritime um, uh, spaces. So. Um, um, I don't think that we we have we need to compare innocent passage uh, with freedom of navigation. Uh, it's uh, the, they they are two aspects of the navigation, uh, but they not need they do not need to be linked or interpreted uh, one according to the other or vice versa. So, uh, of course, the Innocent Passage, uh, uh, now we have the Territorial Sea, it's an area where, where state sovereignty uh, uh, expands, uh, is not a functional sovereignty, but a full territorial sovereignty. So, of course, Innocent Passage cannot be um, in its grounds uh, uh, have uh, the same grounds than freedom of navigation. Thank you very much, uh, Professor Klein. Look, I, 
In terms of comparing the two, I, I mean, my way of thinking is not so much one is a lower level than the other. I, I wasn't quite sure, sure what the comparator was, but I think in every instance, it's always everything to do with the law of the sea is usually a balancing act between different interests in different contexts, whether we're balancing the idea of the, uh, you know, mare liberum and um, you know, inclusive interests versus exclusive interests of coastal states. And really the difficulties we have with navigation are a manifestation of that kind of balance as well, where we're trying to say, well, what kind of navigational rights are we willing to give other states when we're dealing with a body of water that is quite close to, to shore of a particular state? And the coastal state feeling that it needs to protect its interests in different ways and, you know, to what extent are we going to favour that? over you know commercial interests in maintaining shipping and strategic interests in being able to move military vessels around so i think what we've seen throughout the development of the law in this area and in the various tests that we have in in the different interpretations of those rules these days is really just that question of balance and are we seeing a recalibration away from what has been a traditional freedom of navigation that was very much advocated by the United States and its allies during the time of the negotiation of UNCLOSE, where we see states far more concerned about um, their own exclusive interests these days. And that gets manifest in the interpretations of due regard in the interpretations of what constitutes a threat uh, on the use of force as well. So uh, to me, it's just where are you going to, to find the balance in any given body of water and in any given factual scenario? You and Aris? Uh, well, I agree with uh, Natalie Klein and George Caracciolo. Of course, this is uh, the freedom of navigation is a very general notion. It's like an umbrella notion and principle, and it depends actually uh, when you're speaking. Uh, if you see, for instance, uh, the right of innocent passage, the history of the right of innocent passage for warships, it's very characteristic. It's um, it depends actually, it reflects, it reflects the, the balance of power. Uh, we often tend to forget, especially the Americans tend to forget, that in uh, the Hague, uh, during the Hague um, uh, conference, codification conference in 1930, the United States uh, was against the freedom, the right of innocent passage of warships. They would consider this as a threat. Uh, in 1958, it was totally different. So. I think uh, they were, of course, in favor of the right of innocent passage for worship, and the Soviet Union was against. And in 1973, both were in favor, because meanwhile, uh, the United the Soviet Union became a blue water navy, so it needed uh, this freedom in order to exert its, uh, its uh, military power. So in general, it is uh, what I'm trying to say, uh, is that the freedom of navigation is quite, uh, I would say, volatile notion because you can, depending on the period, you can um, consider that it is it includes uh, many uh, types of passage. Today, we know that in UNCLOS, uh, there are the types of passage that are well codified. Uh, so to end, I'm, I agree. I don't think you should compare as a notion the right the freedom of navigation or to, to oppose to the right of innocent passage. Thank you. So we're, we're approaching the end. I think we have time for one more question. And um, I was listening to um, Professor Klein's uh, discussion on escort, rules of escort. And then I, I asked myself, well, when, when does the need for escort arise? Is it before the threat or after the threat? Um, and for, for example, coming from the field of energy, I think about, for example, what Professor, uh, Dr. Blackwell was saying about how a third of the world's supply of LNG and hydrocarbons are coming through the Straits of Hormuz. And I asked myself if economic interests or energy interests were being um, threatened, would this justify um, an escort um, of some kind through these areas? But, but not necessarily just that area, any area. Uh, if a nation is, is dependent on energy supplies, um, these things tend to seem like there's a chicken and an egg situation. If you apply escort, you're, you're raising the stakes. Uh, but if you don't apply 
escort, you're exposing uh, such shipments to um, potential harm. So how do you how do you address that conflict, um, Judge Carcello? Uh, well, uh, um, I, I don't think that it's possible to give um, a single answer uh, um, uh, to the problem, uh, uh, can a state use escort or not? I think it depends on uh, each specific um, case. Um, so, for example, if I think uh, of oil platform, uh, um, uh, maybe in a situation uh, in, in a very risky maritime areas uh, uh, characterized by uh, uh, piracy or, or a terrorism, uh, uh, increasing of uh, terrorist attack, the um, use of escort uh, around uh, an oil platform uh, uh, can be uh, lawful, uh, but we are in the continental shelf or in the Z uh, um, uh, um, of a certain state. So probably uh, uh, the, 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 this uh, concerned coastal state will offer uh, the escort uh, directly itself. For just uh, and not uh, there, there won't be any need for the uh, um, uh, company of the. Um, oil platform to uh, do uh, everything alone, but uh, utilize an escort passing through the territorial sea of a certain uh, state uh, uh, can have a profile of unlawfulness, uh, uh, but also be lawful if uh, the, 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 the principle of innocent passage is respected, or think of creeping jurisdiction concerning uh, we, we, we have sp spoken about that concerning um, warship navigation in EZ. Uh, Italy, for example, uh, made a very famous declaration uh, uh, while uh, signing and ratifying UNCLOS, uh, and it uh, um, un underlined that uh, warship uh, enjoy uh, freedom of navigation in, in, in EZ uh, in, in, if they are peacefully, of course, navigating but also underline the need for uh, military um, uh, uh, um, uh, operation, uh, peaceful operation uh, in, in EZ. So uh, I think uh, escort can be evaluated ca case by case, not, not uh, a priori uh, in general terms. Thank you. Uh, Professor Klein? Thank you. I, I mean, I think the point that I, I was trying to make is that escorts in and of themselves are lawful. So, so maybe it is a chicken and egg. If you perceive that there's a threat, then just send your escort through. So long as you're continuous and exp expeditious, that you're not threatening force, then it's fine, <laughs> I would suggest. <laughs> Um, but, there, of course, there's a but. I think the key difficulty is that uh, when we're assessing the right of innocent passage, so much comes back to the coastal state's assessment and what the coastal state perceives as prejudicial to its peace, good order or security. And you will have coastal states that consider that the mere presence of the warships coming through a, as a form of escort is going to be in violation and that's when you'll start getting stronger reactions from the coastal state. But I would start from the position that they are per se lawful in their own right. It really just depends on what happens during the escort where you might start running into difficulties or, or violations of the law in that regard. Thank you. And, and finally, Aris, would you like to add? Well, uh, nothing very important. I'm not special to the issue of escorts. Uh, what I want to say is that finally, in this kind of questions, uh, what matters at the end is the reality on the ground. Well, let's see. And uh, finally, it's really the meeting point of international law, international relations. So if one wants really to disrupt, uh, for instance, an, an energy flow, as you talked about that, <clears throat> uh, it should be made very clear to him that this can be costly. And actually, we are not exactly in, uh, in the legal field anymore. So for instance, in the Eastern Mediterranean, the question is, who can do that? Um, 
okay, we know very well that there are many issues with Turkey, but I don't think that Turkey, well, I cannot know that precisely, uh, is uh, will disrupt uh, energy flows because this would be against uh, the notion, the, especially the American notion of freedom of navigation, and this might be quite a political error. So yes, I will join what uh, the previous speaker said. It is really case by case. And actually, this is uh, uh, where uh, the balance of power is invited in the legal equation. Thank you. Thank you very much. So I think this brings it to a close. Uh, final words. First of all, I'd like to thank the administrative team at HMS uh, with Zavit and Shahar and Noga, uh, who have been um, behind the scenes the whole time. Um, I'd also like to thank the presenters for sharing your knowledge and your time with us um, and to get acquainted with you. Uh, we will send you a written uh, summary of the things that have been said for your review and comment um, and final approval before we put it on our uh, HMS site. If you'd like to add or omit anything that has been said, feel free to, to reach out. I think this has been a privilege for all of us. I know I've learned a lot. Um, Professor Choreb, would you like to say the closing remarks? Yes, please. I think that it was very uh, interesting, thoughtful uh, conference. I think that uh, not all the questions are answered. And I think this is the nature of the UNCLUS. From my perspective, speak is an Israeli, and now I am not a government, government employee. Uh, whenever it's possible to Israel to join international fora and treaties, my opinion is that we have to do it. I know what are the hurdles. I know what problem it might cause to Israel. I think because of the very unique uh, relationship relationships that we have with the U.S., we shouldn't uh, see if there is a possibility that uh, the U.S. will ratify, join uh, the UNCLUS to uh, agree with the U.S. about our reservations, make some guarantee or get some guarantees, and then to consider whether to sign it or not. If the case will be that the U.S. will sign or agree, uh, or, or, or ratify or uh, uh, coming to the, the UNCLUS and we will not do it ahead of time, then we might find ourselves in the situations that uh, we can argue it with ourselves. And I, I believe in international fora whenever it's uh, possible for Israel to do it. Uh, so that's my private position. I am not a government employee and that's what I think about. The reason that we as a center try to learn more and more, and I think that you as an expert add to this, is to uh, judge when uh, to come to our government with our final conclusion, because it's not uh, trivial in our situation. So thank you all. I would like to thank especially, as I did it in the beginning, to Oren, who did it very skillfully and did this assignment, completed this assignment on the, each one of you, which bring it a, a point of view. So thank you very much for Australia, good night, for Israel, good evening, for Europe, good evening, and I hope that we will maintain our uh, collaboration. Thank you very much. Thank you all, bye-bye. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you. Bye-bye.